so we've been through that. And we'll get to that. So I'm going to be talking for about half an hour, and I'm quite comfortable with you just putting up your hand and asking questions as I go along. So don't hesitate to interrupt me if there's something I'm talking about that you wanted to ask questions about right away. And I haven't put together too many slides. So these are some of the things that I'll, I'll talk about this afternoon. So on the one hand, the, the work that IFLA is doing out of the headquarters, which is the principles for ebooks, a bit of a European perspective on what's going on, and then some of what I learned from talking with international publishers. And then I'll switch over to what do I think we really need to be thinking about here? And so that's what the right-hand side of the slides is about. So first of all, to set a bit of context, I'm not going to go through these slides in detail. The slides will be available. I'll put them on the Uncovering eBooks blog. I'll make them available, whatever method the co-op uh, has as well. So you can read these um, principles later. But I wanted to touch on them because they really set the context for the work that ICLA does around eBooks. And if you've been working with Canadian eBook principles uh, coming from Call for CLA, then these would be fairly similar ideas. So first one, that a library must have the right to license. So we, we should be able to get books without embargo in the same way that we can in print. Secondly, that we need reasonable terms and conditions and a fair price. Third, that copyright exceptions and limitations should apply to ebooks, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later on. That we need to preserve titles in digital format. That titles should be, ebooks should be platform neutral and accessible, and that they must protect the privacy of library users. So I know that the um, licensing business function group put some guidelines together this year, and they actually refer to a document that I'm going to talk about a little bit this afternoon. So, what's happening at IFLA right now, as far as conversations around ebooks, is that there is huge national variation in what's happening. And I think that sometimes we don't realize how far we've actually come in Canada. But we are in one of the best positions as far as availability of ebooks to public libraries. Academic libraries are dealing with some different kinds of issues, and I am going to focus on public libraries today. That we're usually talking about trade ebooks when we're talking about the, the current issues in libraries. So what we're seeing is that in North America, so in the US and in Canada, availability of ebooks is really quite good. P publishers are all participating. They're participating under sometimes frustrating terms or pricing, but they are all selling to libraries if they're producing digital, or virtually all of them are. We know that in Canada it's in the realm of 75% of publishers are selling to libraries, and most of those ones that aren't just aren't producing ebooks. So it's not the same in other countries. In the UK and in Australia, they have the same multinational publishers dominating their markets, but they don't have the same availability. So Hachette, for example, who we can buy from here, they can't buy from in the UK and in Australia. And I'll come back to why that is in a, in a few minutes. But where we really see differences is in some of the European countries. So in most European countries, ebook use in the consumer market is only at about 1% compared to the 20-ish percent of trade retail uh, sales here. So a very different size of market. They're in much earlier days, and they've had a lot of struggles with getting ebook availability from publishers, persuading publishers to sell, and they've taken some very different approaches. And so in the past six months, uh, at IFLA, we've been looking at what, we had been looking at what the differences were between the approaches. And so some of the, the ways that countries are handling this, you can see the relationship between the size of the country and the language market and the way that they've approached it. So in Denmark, for example, a small population of 5.6 million, they have a national system. It's maintained by the National Library. The purchasing of the collections is done on a national level. And that means that all of the licensing is, is collaborative and national. The challenge in this environment is that pub the biggest publishers do keep pulling out. So they start selling to libraries, it goes a little too well, they pull out because they're losing retail sales, the, the library changes the model, the publishers come back in, then it's too successful again, the libraries pull back out. So, so they're on round three, 
And at this stage, one of the things that's interesting about it is the biggest publisher in Denmark is not participating. They're not selling ebooks to libraries. But the second biggest, biggest publisher is. And so many of the smaller independents are actually launching mm -hmm. ebooks first through the library and then putting them on the retail market. And what's different in Denmark is that because this is a nationally managed system, they have library staff whose entire job is to curate that collection, to create displays, to create online lists, to do reviews of the books and to make recommendations. And so what has happened is that it's actually changed the way that mid-list books are discovered in Denmark. And so for the smaller independent publishers, and even for the second largest publisher in Denmark, they know that because of the library, they are getting new authors introduced to the market. So it's a really good example of the kind of difference libraries can make, and it's in an environment where it's fairly closed, and so we can see and prove what's happening. It has not been a great, a great solution for the best sellers. So it's not, it's not a solution that works well for that largest trade publisher. They're not having any trouble getting their books exposed and sold. But for many, many other publishers, for many other authors, the, the way that this national system works and the opportunities libraries present that are very positive. In contrast to this, and I think the thing that's important to recognize is how much it costs to run a national technology system or a large technology system with ebooks dealing with all of the requirements that are necessary. And Belgium tried this, so they planned to have a national system. They contracted with a technology company. They started the work, they ran for two years, and they couldn't afford to continue. The complexity of running the technology was too great, and they have now shut down that pilot project, and they are seeking a commercial solution on a national level. So the investment that's necessary to run a national system is really very high. Denmark is spending in the neighborhood of $600,000 a year. That includes the staffing to run the system. Uh, and the Netherlands is using a similar model to Denmark. So another national library running a national technology system that they developed in-house. And what they're starting to talk about is how can we share components? So how do we share technology components? And they're also talking with New York Public Library and their, um, because they're doing their own technology system as well at the moment. So there is collaboration going on between North America and the European National Libraries looking at what kinds of ebook systems can exist. In Spain, we see the example of a national library that's using, or a nationally managed system using commercial providers. So it's a case where the, the population is too large and the language market for the publishers is, is too large to manage a national system so far. And so that's a place where they're actually starting a contract with Odillo to buy on a national level. And then something kind of similar to the way that we've worked here is, uh, or the way we used to work with the BC Co-op doing the publishing as a group and then other libra libraries who wanted to could add on with, with that advantage. So that's how it works in Spain as the individual regions in Spain can add their content. They can get a group of people together, put a little more money in, and add for their region. And then in Germany, it actually works very similarly to how it works here. So a commercial provider, a German commercial provider, that the libraries contract with based on their library control area, their library authority. There is something very different about how ebook lending and book lending works in Europe, and that is that the public lending right concept. So the support for cultural heritage in Europe is very high, and that means the funding for cultural heritage is very high. So authors are compensated based on the loans of books in libraries. So they receive a payment for every loan in a library. When you start thinking about the technological implications of this, it's massive. So entire organizations exist, collective management agencies, to manage all these payments. And one of the things that became a, an issue with ebooks in this context is that authors weren't getting public lending right payments for ebooks. So a couple of years ago, the Dutch Library Association, so that's the DOB part of this, 
uh, brought a case against the Collective Management Association, which is the Stichting Lean Rec, to challenge the definition of an e-book or a book in the legislation. And the reason that I'm bringing this up today is because the, dis the, next, the judgment from the Advocate General happened yesterday. So in Europe, this is a really big deal uh, that as of yesterday, an e-book, it looks like an e-book will be defined as a book. And if an e-book is defined as a book, it has a lot of implications. It means that an e-book can be loaned, and an e-book could be resold, and an e-book, a public lending rate applies. So there are a bunch of possibilities if this goes through the next stage. So this is the Advocate General gives an opinion, and then later in this year, we'll actually get the decision of the Court of the European Union saying whether they agree. They often align with what the Advocate General has said. So if an e-book is finally a book in Europe, then maybe that uh, will come down for books in Europe. And maybe if an e-book is a book in Europe, an e-book will be a book here too. So there is, uh, there is attention being paid to what happens from one country to another. And that's what I really saw representing libraries at WIPO is how much the legislators from one country talk to another country. That they are all there, all the, the people responsible for legislation, the people writing copyright in Canada, go to WIPO and they talk to the people who write the copyright laws in, in all the countries in Europe. They talk to the European Union, they're talking to Africa, they're talking to Australia. So they're sharing all of this knowledge and all of the trends when they go to these meetings twice a year. And that's something that is really important for us to be aware of. It's why we have to have representation at these meetings, because otherwise there's no one there speaking for libraries. And IFLA is there, but the Canadian Library Association has very, very regularly also sent representation so that we're there both to talk to our own legislators and to share what's happening in Canada. So the bad news is that when I met uh, as part of IFLA with the International Publishers Association, I asked them, if we're getting somewhere in North America and we, we now have all of the major trade publishers selling to libraries in North America, why is it that the same things aren't happening in the UK and Australia? Shouldn't we be able to hope that when we make steps as libraries in one country, we're working with multinational publishers in a lot of cases, that those same steps should automatically happen in the UK or in Australia? And he explained to me that there's a difference between multinational and international. And these publishers are multinational, which means they are run from their individual country and nobody who, there's no overarching body, the way that there is with Elsevier, so Elsevier is an international company, but Penguin Random House is a multinational company. So North America makes their decisions and it doesn't matter what North America did, UK and Australia can do their own thing and they can behave differently everywhere they operate. Because rights management is national, uh, so the book industry has always worked this way. We can hope that because they share a little bit of data with each other because presumably they occasionally talk to each other if they work for Penguin Canada and Penguin in the UK, that they might eventually see that things are okay in North America and therefore they would be okay in Europe too if they made the changes we've made here. But they don't actually talk to each other very much and they really do think that Europe is totally different from North America. So there isn't a lot of hope here and there isn't a lot of hope for us that that when or if things get better in Europe, that that same effect would happen here. So far we are further ahead, so it's really, from IFLA's perspective, trying to figure out how can we bring the gains in North America to other markets. So when I asked at this same meeting, what could we do to move things forward on better pricing models? It, because IFLA is using the same principle that CLA and Polk are using, which is that in an ideal world, a library would have choices for each individual title about how you purchase. So that you would be able to buy one copy of a book that was a perpetual license at a higher price, and then meet short-term demand with a much lower price, limited-term license. So that's the idea that both the Fair Ego Pricing Campaign and the Colk principles have been using for a couple of years. So one preservation copy, and then one short-term way of dealing with things at a low price. 
And what they said at that meeting is that it really takes a publisher who's willing to experiment and a library who's willing to work directly with the publisher. And so what we need to seek is a multinational publisher who would be prepared to experiment and do a pilot with that different model. So, to move on to the, what's happening now and what is coming next, looking at it from, from an international perspective, but thinking more specifically about Canada, uh, this would be the, the main thing everybody's talking about. We were talking about it at the BC Library Association conference, and we've been talking about it in the licensing DFG, and I think we're probably talking about it at many of our libraries. So while I was at IFLA, I worked a lot on this policy on privacy in the library environment, and it was, uh, it was endorsed by the governing board in August of 2015. So this one is looking at exactly what are we gathering and sharing, and how are we protecting the personal information of our patrons? What are our obligations here? So the important elements that we need to protect individuals' privacy, that we need to be thinking about what, how we can do more, uh, that we need to reject electronic surveillance and illegitimate monitoring. We also need to think about when we are benefiting from the data that we gather about our patrons, how do we do that responsibly? And then um, finally, that we help patrons make informed choices through our media and information literacy training. So you can find the full text of this policy on the IFLA website quite easily, and the URL is on the bottom of the slide, so when I share this, you can also get to it that way. I said I would talk about preventing contract, uh, copyright exceptions and limitations, and this is the one that I think is the most important, and that I talked about last week at, I think it was last week, at the Canadian Library Association Conference copyright uh, session. So the way that our copyright law works now Exceptions and limitations are the way that libraries can operate. So we have copyright that protects the authors, and then we have exceptions and limitations that allow us to operate outside of that protection. So it uh, for the authors. So it means that we can photocopy documents, for example, for personal use, for research use. Those kinds of exceptions are what help libraries operate. And the problem is that the way our legislation is written, we can give away our right to those exceptions by signing a license for digital content. So, and we do give away our rights that have been legislated on a regular basis. So we know that some contracts, the contracts that are being negotiated by university consortiums, it, have considered this. But within public libraries, we're not as careful about this. And so we do sign licenses where we give away rights that were granted to us in legislation. And there are four countries in the world that protect people from this happening. So they are Belgium, Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Portugal. And so in those countries, when you sign a license that makes you give away your, your legislated rights in a contract, those sections of the contract are actually void. And so I think we need to seek this here. In the European Union, the European Library Association and IFLA are trying to support seeking that for Europe. And they'll probably start with one specific exception and protecting that from contract override, but it is part of the current copyright reform process. So it's something we'll need to talk about a little bit more, but we do have a copyright review coming up with our act in early 2018. And so that's the time where we'll need to decide, do we want to try and push for this? And we know that Canadian legislation Canadian lawmakers look to what happens in the UK and look to what happens in Australia as examples. Uh, and so the fact that we do have this kind of, of protection from contract override in the UK means that there's some hope of getting this in Canada. And for public libraries working with digital resources, I think this is the single thing that we can do that would make a, a real difference to protecting us and ensuring our users have their, their full rights when they're using content. So I also wanted to just touch on a little bit of what's happening in the broader marketplace. The news last year was really fairly confusing uh, about ebooks. So we saw a lot of headlines saying that print was rising. 
we saw headlines saying ebook sales slip, what they really meant is ebook sales plateaued. They didn't go down. Um, and the reason that we need to approach this with more curiosity is because a couple of things happened last year. One of them was that agency pricing really took effect, so publishers got to start deciding what the price was for their books on Amazon rather than Amazon deciding. And the other was that self-publishing has really taken off. So I'll, I'll show you what a little bit of uh, some points around that. So I think that the, there's a couple of uh, book, books I have here as, ex, as examples of what's going on with the pricing. So an ebook on Kobo is $14, a trade paperback on Indigo is $18, and a trade paperback on Amazon is $14.50. Why would you buy an ebook that has less rights if you could buy a print book? And I think that consumers are in some way aware that when they buy an ebook, they can't lend it and they can't sell it. So they haven't bought the same set of rights when they've bought that digital copy. And even more dramatically, uh, this book is basically the same price for an ebook or a trade paperback. So no wonder print sales are rising and ebook sales are plateauing. It's, I myself can't imagine paying the same price for an ebook as I would for a print book. And I have a personal ceiling of $12. Like I just won't pay $12, more than $12 for an ebook uh, for my own use because I'm not buying the rights that I was buying in print. And I think that we are seeing the impact of this. The other thing that was going on last year is adult coloring books. So, <laughs> so if you weren't aware, the big increase in print sales of trade paperbacks last year was almost all adult coloring books. So no miracles happened that should change the way that we are collecting in libraries because we can't buy adult coloring books. At least not for lending. Right? You can imagine how messy that would be. Uh, so the other thing that, uh, that's been going on and that you may not be aware of is that when we see all of those reports about the sales of ebooks and print books, they're leaving out the entire self-publishing industry. And at this stage, that represents about half of what's in the top 100 on Amazon. So it's a huge portion of what people are reading that isn't being reported at all. And the bulk of that reading is happening in ebook format. So what's happened over the past couple of years is the purple part of this graph at the bottom that where I've drawn that arrow. That is the decline in the portion of the market that is represented by the Association of American Publishers. So they are representing less and less of the market. And that means their data is less and less accurate. So we really need to keep that in mind. And then what's happening at the top of the graph, and it's representing more and more of the market, is indie books. And it's indie books that have an ISBN and indie books that don't have an ISBN. So they're not part of the market at all. So this, I think, is a bit of an opportunity for us to do some education with our local authors to tell them how they can be real books and get counted in the, in the statistics. All of this information comes from authorearnings.com, which is interesting for bringing together information about what's happening in self-publishing and indie publishing. And just because I think we should be aware of exactly what's being read in this market, uh, you'll see that it's genre. So the big sales when you, uh, when you look at the portions of self-published authors are in the romance, mystery, science fiction, fantasy, uh, and then also in nonfiction. So, so what, there is a lot going on in genre reading in indie publishing. And then finally, um, my last question for you, the thing I think we all need to pay attention to, and there are no answers yet, uh, is, is e-reading really different from print reading? And so far what we've seen is a lot of studies that say you get fatigue from reading on iPads because of the blue light. But I don't think that's really the most important question. That is a technology problem that will be solved, and probably in not that long. But Technology will change and the blue light part will go away. And the question now is, do we actually form memories differently or learn differently when we read on a device compared to when we read on it? And there have been studies that say that, in fact, we form memories better from print and physical objects because our minds have learned to place our, to have, to have cues for our memory within a physical object and the location of a word on a page or the location of a page in a book. 
And that's a really interesting area of research. It's an interesting area where we consider children's literacy, how people learn to read, and, and it's interesting for learning broadly. So there is a group, of, there's a project, a group of academics in Europe. It's called ereadcost.eu. Not a lot out yet. This is research that's going on, but it's something to pay attention to in the long term because we are responsible for things like reading and literacy. And so I think it does matter that we know when we make a choice about one format or another exactly what are we providing to people and what will they get out of it. All right. So I think I have a few minutes for questions, depending on whether my timers are synced up. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Ebook, given the cost of producing an ebook should be less. There's no cost of the paper and the ink and, and all of that, but there is the cost of the marketing and the layout and, and that side of things. So, first, it's because we're dealing with publishers who are producing both print and e. So, they have to charge a certain amount for a book in order to make up the costs of producing the book and that those costs of paying the author and doing than not very much marketing than most of them are doing. Um, so there are savings in, in digital books, but the only place you can really see that is if you look at a publisher who is only producing digital books. And you do see it when you look at what authors choose to price when they produce their own books. Because authors make the same amount of money whether they charge $3 for their own book or they sell their book to a publisher and the publisher charges 14. So they're still only making $2 in most cases with most contracts. So the, the author can charge $3 for, for their self-published book and make the same amount of money and it better represents what the cost is of an ebook. Because really it's very it's quite easy to deal with the formatting and you have the distribution costs are just the portion that Amazon takes away, which if, uh, if the author is signed up for the Kindle Direct program, for example, is the author gets 75% and, and Amazon takes 25 So maybe we'll get to a point where we have more cheap ebooks available because we have more ebook only publishers. As long as they're paying for their New York buildings, that's not going to be the case. All right. If that's all your questions, you know where to go. Yeah? Is there any evidence that producing um, ebooks? So, I'm not totally sure I heard your question, but I'm going to try to paraphrase and you tell me if I'm right. So, is there any evidence that adding ebooks has grown the market? Is that right? Uh, so, I'm not aware of any evidence that it's grown the number of people reading or the, or the total amount being spent on books. It, but there are more books being produced because more authors have access to the market now. So it has broadened what we can read, but there's no evidence that there's more reading taking place or more dollars being spent on books. All right. You know where to find me. Uh, you can look me at, just look up my name and you'll find my email address at BPL. So thank you, everyone.